What I'll start off telling you about is Faraday's experiment. Faraday was investigating the relationship between electricity and magnetism. And so he set up an experiment like this, and he had two coils with a large number of turns on them. And he put a current through one, and this was connected to a lamp. And what he was expecting was you turn, you put the current through this coil, this coil's close by, and that would induce a current in this coil. And therefore you'd see that by the fact that the lamp is lit up. It's not connected to any power supply, so it would be purely the effect of the first coil, the current in the first coil, uh, producing the current here. Uh, but what he found was that actually whilst the power supply was turned on, you wouldn't get the lamp lighting up. And he realised, but he did realise actually, that when you turned the power supply on, and when you turned it off, that's when you got the lamp lighting up. But only for a short time. It didn't stay lit up. It was just when, just in the immediate moments after turning it on or turning it off. So what he realised was that it wasn't having lots, he realised that when you have a current through here that produces a strong magnetic field, it wasn't just having as much magnetic field as possible going through this second coil that caused the light bulb to light up, but it was when there was a change in the magnetic field and the, the larger the change sorry, the larger the rate of change, then you would get a brighter light bulb. So that would mean if you went from a zero current to a large current very quickly, then that would produce a big change in the magnetic field here, and as that was happening, you'd be inducing a current in the lamp. So that was Faraday's experiment. So if we apply... In that case, we'll, we'll look at the details of that a little more and look at the law that Faraday developed based on that. But uh, the general principle is that the conductor has to cut field lines, magnetic field lines. So if you have a wire and you, well, I suppose I'll draw it in red, red for the field. You move it, you move the wire through the magnetic field. Then as this conductor cuts through those field lines, that will force a current to flow in our conductor. And if I move it faster, so I apply a larger force to accelerate it through that field, then it will then there will be more current flowing. All right. uh, if, I, if it was moving at a faster velocity, sure, it would have a larger current flowing, uh, but you're going to need to maintain that, so you'll need to have a larger force. And we'll look at why you have to maintain the velocity by applying force uh, later as well. So, uh, cutting field lines. And it's, again, it's the perpendicular component that counts here for how much current you have, you have flowing. So I could move this conductor very, very fast, parallel to the field lines, and it will, will produce zero current, as long as I move it exactly parallel to the field lines. But if I move it perpendicular, then I'll get maximum. If I move it somewhere between, then I'll get something in between in terms of the current induced. So that's for a straight wire. Um, what about a coil? So we'll go back here to Faraday's experiment. Um, for a coil, it's all about the flux linkage, because if you have a coil with a certain number of turns and you do this experiment, then you'll get the light bulb shining a certain brightness. But if you increase the number of turns on your coil here, then you have large flux linkage, 
and for a larger maximum flux linkage and therefore the rate of change of flux linkage is going to be larger and you get larger brightness there. So because you get larger brightness when you have a large change of flux linkage, that means flux linkage is the crucial thing here. Faraday's law is that the induced EMF is equal to the rate of change of flux linkage. <coughs> so you can either have a certain flux linkage and change that flux linkage faster to produce a larger induced EMF, or you can um, increase the number of turns in the coil and that would give you a larger induced EMF as well. Okay. So that is your induced EMF for various cases, whether it's straight wire or coil. Now, let's say, let's go back to here. We're moving this coil, uh, sorry, we're moving this wire through the field, and that's getting a current induced on it. Um, I should, should have said as well, what direction is the current induced? Well, the uh, Fleming's right hand rule tells you the direction of the induced current. So the motion is indicated by the thumb, field is the first finger again, current is the second finger. So Fleming's right hand rule, if you're inducing a current, so we're moving it down and the field is into the board, the current will be to the right. Do we have a current now that is flowing in a magnetic field? Well, what do we know about that? Well, we know that when you have a current in a magnetic field, it experiences a force. And how do we know the direction that the force will be in? Fleming's left hand rule. So, so we have a current flowing to the right here. Let's use Fleming's left hand rule here, actually, to see what happens. Well, field into the board, current to the right. It's going to experience a force upwards. That's going to be a breaking force, isn't it? It's going to slow that down. That's why you need to apply a force here. And it was Lenz, actually, who appreciated that the direction that the current flows will, will always be such that it will oppose the change that caused it. So uh, Lenz's law means that you have the negative, OK? So current flows to oppose the change that caused it. Okay, so the induced EMF is equal to the negative rate of change of flux linkage. And that is important because it conserves energy. If here we got a magnetic force going down, and that's going to accelerate our wire, and we're going to be getting energy from nothing, all right? But instead, what we get is we get a breaking force, so it turns the kinetic energy into some other form, you put often heat. And that's a very useful principle, actually, that is used on trains for braking. And one of the really intuitive uses of electromagnetic braking, actually, is on tube trains. On tube trains, you don't want all this dust that you get with heat pads that just ha um, produce friction between the brakes and the wheels or the disc brakes. And so you get lots of dust in those cases where you have friction. So this is not using friction. This is just using Lenz's law. All right. Uh, so um, oh, one example that is often quite hard to conceptualize or to conceive of let's say let's take a horizontal coil and we're going to drop a magnet through that coil well <clears throat> we know that the current must flow in such a direction as that it will oppose the change that caused it but that can be quite complex to figure out here so what we do is the change that causes it is this magnet moving towards it. What can this coil do to oppose that change? 
Well, remember, there's going to be a current flowing through here, a current flowing in a coil that produces an electromagnet. So, whilst the magnet is above the coil, this coil will uh, repel the magnet. So, there will be a north pole set up on the top of the coil. And that will repel this, it will apply a braking force to the magnet. Of course, um, in most cases, you're not going to notice any braking force on the magnet. <clears throat> so that's whilst it's above it. What about when the magnet has actually dropped through and is now moving away from the coil? Well, how can the coil oppose the change it causes it this time? It can attract the magnet back to itself. So in that case, you'd actually get the north flip round to this side, okay? So it will have a north there and attract it, therefore there'll be a braking force on the magnet still. Whereas otherwise, if, if the north stayed up here, then it would uh, repel it away and it would accelerate, so you'd be getting energy from nothing. So that's how you deal with that situation. Sometimes you have to also deal with um, a, a plot of the, again it's time, the induced EMF in the coil, and you get perhaps something like this. Uh, so I don't know if I've drawn that too well, but the point is that this peak is smaller than this peak in terms of the size there, and this peak is broader than this peak, so the, the time taken. Uh, the reason for that is that the magnet is actually accelerating all the way through here. Yes, this is the, the coil here is slowing it, uh, is producing an opposing force on the magnet, but it's still accelerating as it goes through here because the weight is the dominant force. So it's not travelling as fast whilst it's above the coil, so the maximum induced EMF is going to be smaller than after it's gone through and it will be, because it's travelling faster, there will be a larger induced EMF. And because the time taken whilst it's approaching the coil, the time of influence the time that it's influencing the coil is going to be larger than, up, than here. It will move away such a distance such that it is not influencing the coil in any noticeable way sooner than it approached it here. So that's why these two are different times, time values as well. So this is a longer time because it's travelling slower, so it's going to cover the same distance in a longer time. Okay, uh, the last part of this electromagnetic induction is the alternator. And an alternator is a coil that rotates in a magnetic field. So we have seen the coil rotating in a magnetic field before we were passing the current through it and that was causing it to rotate because of the magnetic force. But this time what we're going to do is we're going to actually rotate the coil physically. We'll use some mechanical work to rotate it and that will induce a current in the coil. So there's our coil there. And we have our magnetic field here. coil has an area of vague. Uh, as you rotate it, you'll get an induced current, induced EMF. So, what do we need to know about this? Let's define first an angle, theta. So, if we measured theta from the horizontal, for example, then when theta is zero, I'm just going to get rid of this. What is
is the flux linkage in the coil. Well, at theta is zero, it's going to be parallel to the line, so there's no field lines, no field lines through the coil. There's no perpendicular component of field lines through the coil. So n phi is zero. At theta is 90, so if it's at 90, then the plane of the coil is perpendicular to the field lines, so you'll get maximum flux linkage. Okay, and then at 180, it is, uh, sorry, theta is, if it's 180, then um, N5 is back to zero, and then it, it keeps oscillating the field. Okay, then that is the flux linkage. However, let's now consider the rate of change of flux linkage, which is important for working out what the induced EMF is. So, in these cases, delta, delta N phi by del T. Okay, so the coil is parallel to the field lines. However, the velocity of the coils, the edges of the coil, is perpend exactly perpendicular to the field lines, so it's cutting a lot of field lines there. Whereas if theta were 90, then the coil would be moving tangential, parallel to the field lines. So actually, when it's here, the rate change of flux linkage is maximum. And delta N phi by delta T is zero at 90, because it's moving parallel to the field lines, and it's back to maximum at 180. So that's the rate of change of flux linkage, which is the key thing. Um, the induced EMF is equal to the negative rate of change of flux linkage, so the EMF is going to be equal in magnitude but opposite direction to the rate of change of flux linkage. So let's plot these. This is going to be N5 density. So it's zero at zero, then it's maximum. Um, and we just have to decide which way the coil is actually rotating here. Uh, let's say it is rotating clockwise, so actually theta would have gone negative, so I guess we can say that uh, the negative value is going to move in the negative direction like that. So that's equal to t for the time period. Let's redraw the little t over there. And then at theta is zero, rate of change of flux linkage is maximum. Uh, this is actually a plot of the gradient of this graph. The gradient is negative, so it's been maximum and negative. Um, I didn't actually go through it methodically before. At theta is 90, this is zero, so 90, zero. At 180, it's back to maximum, but it's gonna be in the opposite direction. So it's going to be up here, okay, and then it will oscillate between those. That's T there. This is delta N phi by delta T. And then if you had the QCMF, then it's the negative. Okay, so those are our graphical plots of the alternator. Right, last thing to cover is transformers. Uh, however, before I go on to that, I just want to cover one thing that I said that I would cover. I did actually cover it in principle, but didn't actually go through it explicitly. And that was our parallel current carrying conductors. So if you remember, I had a wire coming out of the plane of the board, so it's carrying current out of the board, and another wire carrying current into the board. 
So uh, in that situation, they both have this circular magnetic field. Okay, so I've just drawn the fields as if the others weren't there. Uh, in fact, the fields will interact with each other. I'll try and cover that in a moment. Uh, but they have these magnetic fields, and we have a current carrying conductor in the presence of the magnetic field of the other current carrying conductor. So that means that the wires will experience force from each other, or from the magnetic fields of each other. Fleming's left hand rule is the principle for determining the direction of the force. So first up, we just need to refresh our memories on the direction of the field here. So right hand grip rule, uh, this is anti-clockwise here. And here is clockwise. So if the field line from here is interacting with this wire, then the field will be upwards at that wire. The current is out of the board, so it experiences a force to the left. And this on this wire, the field is going upwards. Current is into the board, so it experiences a force to the right. So if the current in the wires is going in the opposite direction then they will repel and you will be able to see if I just draw to another diagram over here. Two wires carrying, wire, carrying current out of the board here. Again, just as if they're just drawing the fields without worrying about how they integrate. Um, in this case, uh, the, both of the fields are anticlockwise. So what happens here? Well, field down to current out. This time the wire experiences a force towards the other wire. And if you do the same thing here, then it, we should find, so the field is up, current is out, it experiences a force towards the wire. So in that case they attract each other. That would also be the same if both currents are going into the board. How do these fields interact with each other? Well, in this case what happens is the fields merge with each other, sort of add up. to draw another field line in here actually then you get, you get something like this. Okay. So that's what happens in this case. Over here they don't interact with each other like that, they just get squashed in the middle. So that will get squashed in slightly, that will too. So a little bit squashed there and those are squashed too. Okay, all going up. And if you were to draw more, more field lines to get the idea, then you see that in between the in between the wires here, the fields are getting squashed together, the field lines, and they want to spread out to be as spaced out as they are over here, as they naturally would be. So it's repelling them. Whereas here, the fields are merging, drawing the wires together. So that's uh, the current carrying conductors that are parallel, like that. So on to transformers then. Uh, let's draw a diagram over here. Transformer is built around an iron core. The purpose of the iron core is so that the flux through both coils that are going to be wrapped around that core is maximised. Okay, so it maximises the linkage between the two coils. So here's the primary, we draw that on the left, and the secondary. So the secondary is going to have a different number of turns on it. So you've got number of the primary, number of the secondary. <coughs> We're going to assume that the flux through the primary 
is equal to the flux through the secondary. The way that you'd illustrate that, uh, draw your flux lines around here, not crossing over each other, not escaping the iron core. Okay, so we've got a flux through our coils. Now, if the flux through the primary is equal to the flux through the secondary, uh, but the number of turns is different, then that means the flux linkage in those are different. And if you have an alternating current, and transformers only work with an alternating current, then we'll have a change in flux linkage here, a rate of change of flux linkage, and the rate of change is going to be pretty much the same as the rate of change over here, maybe a little bit of lag, depending on the size of the transformer, but essentially delta T will be the same as well. So that will mean that the rate of change of flux linkage is different in both of those, and you know that the induced EMF is equal to the rate of change of flux linkage. So a different rate of change of flux linkage means that you have a different induced EMF in the secondary than the EMF going into the primary. So uh, if you work out the voltage ratio, everything's, con everything's the same apart from the number of turns. So what you'll find is that NP divided by NS is equal to VP divided by VS. Therefore, if your primary no number of turns in the primary is larger than the number of turns in the secondary, then the primary voltage will be larger than the secondary voltage. So what you'll do is you'll get a lower voltage output than your input. So that will give you a step down transformer. So this, this would be VP going up here, and this would be VX coming up here. If you have a larger number of turns in your secondary coil than on the primary, then that will step up your voltage. You'll get a larger voltage output. So that, that's how a transformer works. Also, if also the power is transferred across this as well. So if you have 100% efficiency, whatever power input you have is equal to the power output. So this is 100% efficiency. If it were less than that, so let's say it was 90% efficient, transformers are, in terms of it, if you look on the large scale of a, on the large scale of a power station, uh, a transformer is one of the most efficient components perhaps about 90% efficient. And then in this case, times 0.90 So your power output is 90% times the power input. And the power input is equal to I times V. So that gives you a way calculating what current you should get in the secondary coil as well. So you can work out what the voltages should be from your number of turns and then knowing that, you, and if you know what current you're putting in, then you can work out what your current output is as well. So that is transformers and that covers everything that I needed to cover for electromagnet uh, electromagnetism and electromagnetic conduction, which we just finished off with there. So uh, that's everything for that. If you've got any questions, then just ask me. You can ask me on Twitter or you can comment on the video. I'll try and put in some links to relevant other relevant videos that I've done for G485. And all the best for your exams.